This video is based on an article written by Dan Connolly for The Athletic. You can use my link at theathletic.com slash foolishbaseball for a free 30-day trial, as well as 50% off your annual subscription fee. In 2019, Royals outfielder Bubba Starling and Cubs pitcher Danny Holson made their Major League debuts eight years after being drafted. It was an unceremonious stint for both, as Starling put up rather pedestrian numbers over the course of 197 plate appearances, and Holson pitched three and a third innings all in September. But they made it. And with these Major League appearances, the legend of the 2011 draft class, suggested to be the best ever, grew even more. See, Holton was taken second overall by the Mariners that year, while Starling was taken fifth by the Royals, and their elevation into the big leagues made it so that the first 29 picks of the 2011 draft had made the majors, a feat that hasn't been accomplished by any other draft class, and may very well never happen again. According to Sabre, the Society for American Baseball Research, 66.7%, or two-thirds of first-round draft signees, end up appearing in the majors at all. But what about the chances of the first 29 all making it? Now, there's all sorts of factors worth foregoing here, such as recent drafts having more success due to better scouting, and higher picks being more likely to make it. But using a little bit of 11th grade math, I know those chances could be summarized as 0.667 to the 29th power, meaning that the odds of the first 29 picks in any given draft all making it to the big leagues is, drumroll please. 0.0008%. So let's talk about the other picks real quick. Here's a chart of those 29 major leaguers sorted by their career wins above replacement according to baseball reference. There are some current sub-replacement level guys, but they're all still relevant. Blake Swihart was part of Boston's 2018 World Series run. Robert Stevenson has nasty stuff and great potential as a reliever for the Reds, and Tyler Beattie is the only guy on here who didn't sign in 2011, but was drafted 14th overall by the Giants and pitched a lot for them this past season. At replacement level, there's Jed Bradley and Chris Reed. 11 career innings between the two of them. Still, they made it. Taylor Guerrieri and Dustin Ackloud, sorry, I mean Danny Holson, pitched in 2019, so that's nice. So did Sean Gilmartin. Heck, Matt Barnes was even one of Boston's better relievers this season. And at the top, you'll see Joe Ross, who started a World Series game. That's more than a lot of players can say. Archie Bradley is a reliever who had a freaking triple in the playoffs. Enough said. Joe Panic was a big part of the Giants' 2014 championship and won a gold glove in 2016. Dylan Bundy had a seemingly promising career derailed by a 2013 Tommy John surgery, but he's still one of Baltimore's better pitchers. Not that that's saying too much. As the third overall pick, Trevor Bauer was somehow the second UCLA right-handed pitcher selected in the draft that year. He's also self-described as one of the most scientific pitchers in MLB, for what it's worth. Jose Fernandez was an incredible pitcher who did some incredibly dumb things and sadly paid the ultimate price. He was a superstar from a young age, and could have ended up at the top of this chart if he were still with us. I don't have too much analysis here, but these guys are all excellent franchise players who may still somewhat improve in the next couple years. Wong just won his first career gold glove, while Baez and Gray were both 2019 All-Stars. Speaking of 2019 All-Stars, these guys are the cream of the crop, at least for the first 29 picks. So, now that we've given those 29 major leaguers a quick rundown, let's do a real deep dive on a few of the biggest players this stacked draft class produced. In terms of wins above replacement for those first 29 picks, Francisco Lindor tops the list for now. It's easy to see why. He made his debut at age 21 in 2015 and immediately established himself as a force to be reckoned with. Among shortstops in their first five seasons, he ranked second in home runs behind the great Ernie Banks and second in wins above replacement behind the ever underrated Archie Vaughn. Drafted eighth overall by the Indians that year, there was a lot of uncertainty regarding who would be available when Cleveland went on the clock. Indian scouting director Brad Grant told The Athletic he was hoping Bauer would miraculously drop to eighth in the draft. 
Bauer, of course, went third overall to the Diamondbacks. And once the Nationals settled on Anthony Rendon for the sixth pick, it became apparent that Cleveland would be choosing between two great middle infield prospects. In the end, of course, the Indians picked Lindor. But don't feel too bad for the other great middle infielder, as it was Javi Baez who ended up going to the Cubs one pick later. As Connolly writes, Cubs scouting director Tim Wilkin was smitten with Baez from the start, and would have even picked him had Lindor also fallen. And while these two studs are two of the biggest names in Major League Baseball, neither turned out to be the best player in the draft class. Because despite how stacked the early proceedings were, the best player wasn't selected until the fifth round. Famously drafted as a second baseman, current, well, at least for now, Red Sox right fielder Mookie Betts was selected in the fifth round that year. And while the cream of the crop in the first round have put up between 25 and 30 wins above replacement, it's Mookie who is on another planet with a whopping 42. Boston developed the scrawny second baseman into a legitimate power threat and one of the best defensive outfielders the modern game has seen. It just goes to show that the draft is still an inexact science. Even in the best draft ever, the best player was picked 172nd overall. In fact, depth is one of the strong suits for the 2011 draft. Sure, those first rounders are special, but rounds 2 through 10 featured the Pirates star slugger Josh Bell, current Indian starter Mike Clevenger, Pirates prospect turned Tampa stud Tyler Glasnow, 2019 MVP finalist Marcus Simeon, 2018 Cy Young and MVP vote getter Blake Trinan, and your favorite control freak, Kyle Hendricks. Even the absolute tail end of the draft had solid MLB relievers, like the string bean slinger Carl Edwards Jr., who factored into the Cubs' 2016 World Series run, as well as Mets bullpen ace Seth Lugo, otherwise known around the league as Le Spinny Curveball Man. Wait, no, no, that's just me who calls him that. But let's go ahead and get back to that first round, because as pointed out by Connolly in The Athletic, the 2019 World Series was driven by star power from the 2011 draft. Let's talk about the Nats and the Astros. Hey, it's Tony Two Bags. That's probably what National Scouting Director Chris Klein said when Anthony Rendon was somehow available to be drafted sixth overall by Washington, as Rendon was seen as a top two pick in the draft. Fast forward eight years later, and the long underrated Rendon has, in a stunning turn of events, finally been recognized by the public as a superstar after his terrific 2019 and postseason success with the team that drafted him. In the past three seasons, Rendon trails only Mike Trout, Mookie Betts, and Christian Yelich in Fangraphs War, so it's safe to say he's in pretty elite company. In the 2019 World Series, he launched two key home runs in Game 6 and Game 7, and was unbelievably clutch throughout the postseason. In fact, his late game plate appearances and elimination games went as follows. Walk, home run, double, double, home run, double, home run, and finally a flyout. While Rendon was plying his trade at Rice, George Springer, who was drafted five picks later, was doing his thing at UConn. In fact, as Connolly writes for The Athletic, Springer's early junior year struggles actually delighted former Astros scouting director Bobby Heck, who had been tracking Springer for years. Perhaps he wanted to see his draft stock fall a bit to ensure his availability when the Astros picked. Of course, those struggles are a thing of the past, and Springer has transformed into not just a great regular season player, but one of the greatest World Series hitters of all time. Among players with at least 50 plate appearances in the World Series, Springer currently ranks second in on-base plus slugging all time, somehow beating out Lou Gehrig, Babe Ruth, and the man they call Mr. October. Springer was MVP of the 2017 World Series against the Dodgers, and likely would have been in contention for MVP of the 2019 series had the Astros pulled it out in the end. That leads us to Springer's teammate at the number one pick in the whole 2011 draft, Garrett Cole. The Pirates deserve a lot of credit for recognizing Cole's talent, as Danny Holson, Anthony Rendon, and Trevor Bauer were also in contention for the top pick in the draft. That being said, his time in Pittsburgh wasn't where he fulfilled his potential. See, organizationally speaking, the Pirates of the mid-2010s stressed a pitch-to-contact approach with their pitchers. To their credit, the Pirates experienced quite a bit of success in this time, breaking a 20-year stretch of losing seasons. But when Cole was traded to Houston, many speculated that he would become a superstar with the organization that was perhaps best known for its pitcher development. And so, Cole did just that. He became a superstar 
instantly. In the past two seasons, he's third in Fangraph's war among pitchers, trailing only the brutal NL East combo of Scherzer and DeGrom, and he also has the most strikeouts in that time frame, a whopping 602, including 326 in 2019 when he broke Randy Johnson's record for single season strikeout rate among qualified pitchers. The reason for this freak swing and miss stuff may be found in Cole's spin rate on his four-seam fastball, which has increased unlike anything I have ever seen before. It's deeply upsetting. He has added more than a tick on his four-seam fastball velocity as well since his last year in Pittsburgh. Of course, Cole was pretty much nails in the postseason and pitched well in the World Series despite his loss in Game 1. He may also very well become the second Cy Young Award winner in his draft class after Blake Snell. Oh yeah. Blake Snell was in this draft class too, can't forget about Blake Snell. One thing that's beautiful about a draft class like this one is that its legacy is not static, it's still changing. Rendon and Cole are free agents this offseason, and will probably sign for, in my estimation, a combined $450 million. For Rendon, that could be back in Washington, but Cole seems like he's on his way out of town. At the moment, your 2011 draft all-star lineup would look something like this. Although, as a branded Nimmo apologist myself, I may want him going forward instead of Kevin Pillar. This video started with a rundown of those 29 consecutive major leaguers, but that too is a number that could change. 30th overall pick Levi Michael finished his year with a 737 OPS in AAA for the Giants, so he could be knocking on the door if he finds the right club this offseason. 31st overall pick Mikey Matuk already has big league experience, and 32nd overall pick Jake Hager is in a similar situation to Levi Michaels, only having last played in Milwaukee's system. If Michael and Hager both make it, even if it's just for a day, that would make 32 consecutive big leaguers to start the 2011 draft, and with that would come even more great Trevor stories to tell. Speaking of Trevor's storytelling, this episode of Baseball Bits was based on an article originally published in The Athletic. The Athletic provides its readers with the best baseball coverage and storytelling available. They employ a world-class team of writers that provide coverage on all your favorite organizations at the local level as well as at the league level. On top of this, the website and app are completely ad-free, so no more annoying pop-ups. So, if you want to read more great articles, you can use my link at theathletic.com slash foolishbaseball for 50% off your yearly subscription as well as a 30-day free trial. Once again, thank you to The Athletic for partnering up with me on this episode of Baseball Bits. <laughs>